This program is brought to you by Emory University. I'd like to welcome you to the 2013 Emory International Law Review Symposium and the David J. Biederman Lecture. My name is Bethany Barnes, and I am the Executive Symposium Editor for the Law Review. It is my pleasure to welcome everyone here today. This year's symposium follows a great tradition of our journal to create a public discourse on emerging issues in international law. Our past symposium have covered a range of topics, including areas such as international terrorism, an examination of international frameworks in the wake of natural disasters, and most recently, the scope of international law in response to online warfare and revolutions. This year's symposium covers new territory by focusing on the future of the International Criminal Court. The, symposi excuse me, the symposium committee's decision to focus on the International Criminal Court was inspired by the court's 10th anniversary this past year. In the words of the late Professor Biederman, the International Criminal Court represents the aspiration of the international community that individuals are endowed both with significant <clears throat> significant rights under international law. Our panels explore the contours of the International Criminal Court in several respects. Our first panel will focus on retributive justice and restorative justice in the context of achieving peace. But before we begin our program today, we're going to have a brief welcome from our Vice Dean, Prof Professor Adie. So allow me please on behalf of Dean Shapiro, who would be here uh, except for being out of town, on behalf of uh, the law school faculty on, and on behalf of the, real, the entire law school, community to welcome you here to the symposium today. Uh, the topic, as Bethany began to describe it, really addresses, I think, one of the most important issues that as a global community we're facing today. Um, I think of that issue or the set of questions that will be discussed over the course of the day as arising at the intersection, in a sense, of two distinct phenomena. The first, and in some sense more familiar, is the increasing integration of the global community. Now, 10 years ago or 20 years ago, maybe even slightly longer than that, there was the notion that this integration was a story about harmony, and as I sometimes describe it, it's about Barney, and you know, we, I love you and you love me. We now have the benefit of hindsight that it hasn't worked out quite that way, but there is harmony or no harmony an increasing level of integration. And that's part of what I think drives the importance of our topic today. The other thing that drives the importance of the topic, or it's the, the intersection of these two, is an increasingly strong commitment to, and interest in, and engagement in, in the normative values of justice across the globe. So questions of the obligations of states to their citizens, questions of how we ensure justice within national territories and across national boundaries have been issues of concern for international law, for domestic law, in international communities, in domestic communities, to an increasing degree over the last 10, 20, and 30 years. And so I think at the intersection of those, we have this incredibly important topic of international criminal justice, at the center of which, in turn, is the International Criminal Court. That's our topic for, uh, our topic for today. Um, uh, for a long time, the International Criminal Court, of course, was just a pipe dream, really, we would say, or sort of a, a pious aspiration among a group of human rights activists and academics. Um, it's hard to believe that after, it's a, slightly more than 10 years that the International Criminal Court has actually been a functioning institution in practice and increasingly a pillar of our international legal order. When we talk about the core institutions of international legal order, we increasingly include, regularly include, the International Criminal Court among those. 
Um, it's appropriate, though, after 10 years of its existence, to also cast a critical eye on the institution and to ask questions about what its future holds, hence the topic of today's symposium of the future um, of, the, of the ICC. There are questions about the scope of its docket, questions about prosecutorial discretion, questions about the geographic focus of its prosecutions and investigations, all of which I'm sure we'll engage over the course of the day. Uh, the symposium uh, committee has brought together a wonderful group of folks to engage this topic, uh, beginning with sort of our sort of government actors at the international and domestic level, and led by Ambassador Rapp, who we're pleased to have here to give the keynote lecture for the symposium, as well as the Biederman lecture, um, as well as other figures from government, practitioners who are engaged in this important area of law, and of course, distinguished academics who have been writing on this topic for many years and who will add greatly to the discussion. So I want to thank again all of our speakers for, for being here and for joining the discussion. We're grateful you add so much to the intellectual life of the Emory Law School community and so we're glad to have you here for that. My thanks to the symposium committee and most of all to Bethany Barnes for her leadership of it and to all the members of the, of the Emory International Law Review for, for your work on making the symposium happen. And also let me, uh, although I'll reiterate this later on this morning, um, let me thank the members of the Biederman family and all the supporters of the Biederman lecture for helping to make that lecture and this gathering possible. So with that, let me turn the, suppose, the podium back to Bethany, who uh, will, uh, will sort of walk us through the program, I believe, a bit and introduce our first speaker. But welcome again on behalf of the law school. First on our program, we will hear from Mr. Julian Nichols. Mr. Nichols is a trial attorney with the Office of the Prosecutor for the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia in the, ne in the Netherlands. Mr. Nichols earned his LLM in public international law, spe specializing in international criminal law from Leiden University Law School. Mr. Nichols is also an alumnus of Emory Law, earning his JD with distinction and while he was at Emory Law, he was a member of the Emory International Law Review. It gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Mr. Julian Nichols. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, thanks first to Kadar and to Bethany for bringing me back here. It's a pleasure to be back in Atlanta. I've only been back once since I graduated, so it's uh, especially nice to be here on this occasion. I also want to thank Professor Van de Viver um, for when I was here, getting me interested in international law and in public and in international criminal law in particular. Um, it's also partly because of Professor Van de Viver that I ended up going to Leiden University to study international criminal law. After I'd been a public defender, for six years, I called him and um, asked him what he thought about whether I should go to Leiden, and he encouraged me to do so. And it's one of the best decisions I ever made because it led directly to me working in the Office of the Prosecutor at the ICTY. Um, I've worked as a trial lawyer there on several cases, the Burgeoning case, the Lemai case, the Popovich case, and currently on the Karadich trial. I'm gonna try to share today briefly some of my views on investigating and prosecuting war crimes and crimes against humanity at the ICTY. And I'll try to show how our experiences, our challenges, and some of the problems we had are reflected uh, by the situation, the challenges facing the ICC, which the ICC has faced and is continuing to face. In May 1993, the UN Security Council in Resolution 827 established the ICTY because of the ongoing conflict in the Balkans. And at the beginning, it was uncertain whether the ICTY would uh, work as a court at all. It was viewed almost as an experiment. It began its work slowly. It faced many of the same criticisms that the ICC faces regarding pace of investigations, um, obtaining indictments, obtaining suspects at large, and trials. And if you talk to people from the ICTY who were there in the very beginning, they talk about 
how they had two hallways of a building and they looked at each other and didn't know how to start or how to, how to get the place rolling. But 20 years later, in my view, the achievements of the IC2I are undeniable. Just some statistics, there have been 161 individuals indicted, 134 proceedings have been concluded. There are proceedings now for 27 persons accused still underway. Uh, very importantly for us, no fugitives since the arrest and transfer of Goran Hadzic in July 2011. And we're closing our doors soon. Everybody working there is aware that our uh, time is coming to an end. The trials are concluding. Um, but we feel a sense of achievement, especially that all the, uh, there are no continuing fugitives as we complete our work. And the achievements we've made at the ICTY show that today, um, 20 years after I graduated from law school, that international criminal justice is a reality. 20 years ago, the idea of trying commanders, uh, let alone heads of state, for crimes against humanity and war crimes was difficult to imagine. Uh, I think it's almost fair to say that, that impunity was almost the norm at that time. And the courts developed rapidly as an institution since I started in late 2000. The pace of the trials, once quite slow, has been speeding up. Um, we were possibly too relaxed in the pace we were taking around 2000, but now it almost feels like being a public defender again, um, as if I had 70 or 80 cases instead of one because of the uh, rapid pace of the trials, which the judges expect. And basically completely gone is the sense we had, and I think the defense lawyers had in the beginning of kind of feeling our way through a new system, a new tr trial process, um, as uh, we worked through different procedures and new law was created. That's basically gone. The ICTY now, it's matured. It's developed into an efficient, fully functioning criminal court. Uh, there's no longer, in my view, any aspect of novelty in that court. It's just a criminal court prosecuting serious cases. And that that alone is a major achievement. The ICTY, ICTR, other ad hoc tribunals, like the special court for Sierra Leone, which convicted Charles Taylor last year, I think have demonstrated that prosecution for these types of crimes, crimes against humanity, war crimes, genocide, international courts, works, it's feasible, it's necessary, and it's got to continue. However, there are some major difficulties we confronted at the IC2Y in the beginning, in fulfilling our mandate and in investigating and prosecuting cases. These challenges are also faced in even stronger measure by the ICC. Some of the most significant, not all, but three of the most that come to my mind, significant problems or challenges which are common to both courts are the following. One, access to crime scenes, evidence, and witnesses, and the related issue of witness protection. Two, ensuring cooperation from local state authorities or whichever authorities there are present in the particular region in obtaining the arrest of indicted persons. Three, working with local prosecutors and local courts try the lower level offenders that will not, should not, cannot be tried by the ICTY or by an international criminal court. And I'll talk briefly about these issues in turn. Uh, first, access to crime scenes. One of the first crucial steps in any investigation is gaining access to the crime scene. Prosecution has to be able to send in investigators, experts, and lawyers into the field to gather the evidence. It's not enough to have a great team if they can't leave the airport, if they can't reach the scene that's been described 
to the office by survivors or which has been identified by aerial imagery or otherwise identified as a suspected crime scene. The sooner a mission can be organized to collect and process the evidence, it's more likely it won't be destroyed, concealed, contaminated, and it'll have greater probative value. I know that what I've just said is obvious, but gaining access was one of the biggest challenges we faced at the ICTY. And it remains a massive challenge to investigating crimes in the context of ongoing armed conflicts or recently concluded conflicts. We face this problem regarding Bosnia and Herzegovina before the Dayton Accords. For example, it was impossible for our investigators to go to Priador until sometime in 1996 to investigate reports of the alleged camps and crimes which had occurred there until almost till over four years after the crimes had occurred. It was a long time, it was often years after the crimes before ICTY investigators were able to get to other major suspected scenes, crime scenes. A long time before we were able to get to alleged killing sites and analyze and seize evidence there. And a long time before we could locate and exhume uh, potential mass graves. So it was very similar to the situation faced by the ICC today. We were trying to investigate alleged crimes in the former Yugoslavia and there were parts of the countries that we couldn't even get access to. Uh, once, however, once we were on site, we were able to seize all kinds of important physical evidence. Huge amounts of shell casings at suspected detention and execution sites. Wires and pieces of cloths ripped into strips, which could have been used as blindfolds and ligatures. Samples of blood and blood and uh, tissue for testing and photographic evidence of suspected crime scenes. Um, I'll, I'll very briefly go through a few slides to show these types of, uh, this type of evidence we were able to gather and see once we finally got access to the region. So these are investigators at a suspected detention site um, gathering shell casings, strips of cloth which could have been blindfolds, led to suspected execution sites where there was evidence also to be obtained and analyzed. Um, the next couple pictures aren't, aren't very pleasant, but I think it's important to show them. We were then able to find mass graves and exhume them. See the evidence in the mass graves, blindfolds, ligatures, and bring that back to The Hague. Delayed access to crime scenes is better than none, but it makes it much more difficult to piece together the story of what happened. Uh, the later you gain the access, the more problems you may have with issues like secondary graves, where typically there may be an execution site, or first a detention site, excuse me. Then this group of people will be taken to an execution site. After the execution, they may be buried in a mass grave in one location, and then later, as perpetrators are concerned about that evidence, they'll be dug up, moved to another site. So that second mass grave is the one that's found, and it's the task of the investigators and the lawyers to trace back who are all these people, what happened to them, how did they get here. Now, those slides aren't pleasant to look at, but they, they illustrate the problems and the gravity and seriousness of the crimes we're talking about. Uh, security. Once we were finally able to access suspected crime scenes and get on the ground, it was still difficult even getting, once there, to carry out the necessary investigations. 
uh, crime scenes like the ones I just showed you, they need to be secured while they're processed, which takes time. The staff need secure facilities to work in. Security was a major concern, major concern for our staff in these early missions. Because they're investigating crime scenes and other locations where the suspects still resided, sometimes in positions of great local power, sometimes in military and, and uh, police hierarchies. Uh, the conflict may have been officially over, but these locations were still far from safe. And we had the advantage of uh, peacekeepers, S4, to escort us while doing our work. Even simple things like, well, not that simple, but even things like demining made it very difficult to get to and access some of the evidence. Uh, documents, even if able to access the region and the crime scenes, it's crucial for the kind of cases we prosecute to seize and analyze the pertinent documents collections. Military, police, political document collections will often contain the best and actually vital, crucial linkage from the perpetrators on the ground up to the military and political leadership. It seems simple, but the orders from the command down the chain and the reports from the field commanders back up the chain will tell a lot of the story. But these collections need to be seized early because of the substantial time it takes to catalog them, analyze them, translate them, and not have the terrible experience of being halfway through trial and realizing you have a crucial document that you hadn't uh, been able to analyze and have translated before then. Um, again, though, it's obvious, but without access, it's very difficult to get these collections. They can be requested. Um, the local authorities or the local peacekeepers can try to get them for you, but the best way is for the OTP to be able to seize them themselves. And we were fortunate enough to gain um, a huge amount of these collections and documents once we gained access to the field. And it's not just the major documents, orders at the top, which are important. Uh, very facially mundane documents like vehicle logs, fuel logs, can end up being crucial pieces of evidence. Uh, we found that simple vehicle logs for military trucks and buses often contain detailed information of when and where these vehicles went, which military base they left from, where they went on a certain day that we know is an important day, when they came back, how many persons were transported, whether they're prisoners or soldiers. And sometimes, by analyzing those logs, they will show you directly to suspected detention or execution sites. They'll identify the units, the troops that were involved, and they'll corroborate witness testimony. But again, the only way you can use that evidence is if you get the document collections early enough. Access to witnesses, especially survivors and other victims in a manner which does not jeopardize them or their families is another very difficult issue. Again, once you're able to get into the region, once you're on the ground, you may not, it may be virtually impossible to interview the witnesses that you need. The same is true of insider witnesses, as we call them, persons who may have been involved in the crimes, either as truck drivers or shooters and execution squads, or just locals who saw and know what happened and are willing to talk about it. These insiders face the same or even higher dangers as victims do in cooperating with us. And these problems, these issues have been problematic at the ICTY. The closer in time to the conflict, the more difficult it is to interview and obtain the testimony you need from witnesses on the ground. What's required, obviously, and we have put in place a good one, I think, is a uh, victim witness unit that's independent from the OTP, that's professional, that's able to protect these vulnerable witnesses and their families. Um, but even then, it can still be very difficult because just contacting the witnesses
can put them in jeopardy. Quite often, these people, these witnesses live in remote villages, and it's impossible to even visit them without everyone in their community knowing that the OTP has come by to speak to them. And uh, it goes without saying that when you're a prosecutor, one of the worst nightmares that keeps you up at night is getting a witness hurt or killed because they were willing to cooperate with you, speak to you, and take the risk of telling the truth. Um, the second issue, state cooperation in arresting the suspects and further down the line providing documentation. It's another significant problem during and soon after the conclusion of armed conflicts, securing the arrest of the accused. Um, as we know, state and local authorities may not cooperate. Fugitives may enjoy popular support and be considered local heroes and be protected by the local authorities. We faced this significant problem as well in the beginning. We don't have a police force and the ability of peacekeepers and the local authorities was often not sufficient in the beginning um, to obtain arrests. So there was a time when our major ICTY indictees uh, could be seen on TV in public going to football games in, in complete impunity. Um, similarly, these investigations are much more difficult if you don't have the level of cooperation with the local authorities where they'll give you access to any of their archives and documentary evidence. Third point, working with local prosecution authorities and local courts to investigate and prosecute lower level offender cases. It's simple reality, it's not possible, it's not the function of the ICTY, and it shouldn't be to prosecute all the lower level offenders in our conflict. We're suspected of committing crimes within the jurisdiction of our statute. And the same is true, of course, for the ICC. Therefore, working with local prosecutors and courts is crucial on this issue. There are many times, many times I've sat across the table from an individual, somebody I strongly believe took part in mass murder, and I believe I have the evidence to convict him or her quite simply, but I can't because we can't try everybody and we can't try these lower level uh, direct perpetrators. But that direct perpetrator Impunity is incredibly destructive to the local community. And I don't know how to answer, and I've been asked by a victim, hey, how come, uh, by a survivor, how come that person hasn't been arrested? I recognize them at the execution site. Nobody's arrested them. And I don't, until there's a local operating court which can prosecute those types of crimes, I don't have an answer. Uh, and some of the crimes We've investigated the victims and perpetrators knew each other, sometimes coming from the same villages or neighboring villages in a small area. And it's also difficult to answer to a victim, a survivor or a family member of a survivor, why the suspected shooter or direct perpetrator still lives in his house, still lives at home in his village, while the victim's been cleansed, to use a non-legal term, and can't come home and knows that this person, this notorious criminal, uh, owns a coffee bar in the center of town. During, when there's that type of impunity, those types of suspects walking around in, in the community in the face of the victims, it's almost impossible for, uh, I believe, for relations to normalize and move forward. I think the, the ICTY OTP has been pretty successful on this issue, uh, working with state courts, war, tri war crimes tribunals in the former Yugoslavia um, to deal with these issues. We have a transition team in the OTP, uh, which worked and coordinated case files we had that were transferred back to local courts. Some of them it was decided it was more appropriate for them to be tried locally. And this transition team um, worked with and liaised with the local courts and prosecutors 
to help them on these crossover cases. And in my experience, it's, it's just simply crucial that that type of cooperation um, be set up as soon as possible. It's immensely gratifying personally to me to see local courts uh, progressing and functioning, now trying these direct perpetrators and lower level offenders in large numbers. And their local courts have been gaining expertise, speeding up, um, getting their feet on the ground. I've seen uh, names familiar to me from my investigation showing up in their indictments, which is uh, a very, very good feeling. Now these difficulties I've discussed, which were confronted by the ICTY, keeping in mind that we had one situation, one area to deal with, not many. Um, access to crime scenes, access to evidence, access to witnesses, security concerns for our staff, security concerns for the witnesses, getting state and local cooperation in the arrests. These issues are magnified in the situations currently faced by the ICC. Uh, for example, if you look at the Lubanga trial judgment, Paris 129 to 167, which I just recently reread, to me it's almost heartbreaking um, to read what the situation was on the ground when they uh, first went into DRC and tried to carry out their work. Uh, you can look at the, the inability to arrest Joseph Kony of the Lord's Resistance Army in Uganda after all the publicity in the last year about his activities. The protected status of Omar al-Bashir, President of Sudan, who's been able to travel without fear of arrest. The inability, as, as I explained, we had to even gain access to areas necessary to conduct a proper investigation, for example, Darfur, and the, then the very, very difficult situation of trying to access physical evidence, witnesses, documentary evidence, and your trial is only going to be as good as your investigation. Um, despite these problems, and still facing these challenges, uh, Although it's not going to be the answer to all the problems, the ICC is still, in my view, the future of international criminal justice. It'll be here when the ad hoc tribunals are gone. Um, it will be the court to carry on this work. Can it be considered successful during its first 10 years? <coughs> I don't think that question can be answered just by looking at the trials um, completed so far one conviction and one acquittal. I think you also need to look at the fact that the court's active and it's pursuing its mission. There are 18 cases and eight situations before the ICC. Four state parties have referred cases. The Security Council has referred situations in Darfur and Libya. And Kenya is the only proprio mutu investigation so far um, showing that the court has been restrained there, but is actively pursuing its job, and it has concluded its first two trials. Uh, one other point, and this was spoken of earlier today about um, regions targeted by the court. There's been a lot of criticism aimed at the court for selective prosecutions, the targeting or focusing on African countries. Um, Others have pointed out, but I think it should be kept in mind that all but one of the situations, as I just said, before the court, before the ICC, Kenya, are either self-referred or referred by the Security Council. So in my view, that criticism has to be tempered by the reality of how the cases reach the court. Overall, its activity in the first 10 years has to be seen in a positive light, although there have been criticisms, questions of efficiency that, that will be spoken about today. It's moving ahead with investigations. It is conducting trials. It's reaching verdicts. And what I've tried to show is it's doing so under extraordinarily difficult conditions, similar to those which we faced at the ICTY. Let me conclude that 
international justice, the work of the international courts, my court, the other ad hoc courts, and the ICC um, are, I believe, rapidly progressing, if you look at the last 20 years, and moving forward as they should be, as fast as they can, towards um, preventing the kind of impunity that was the norm recently. These types of crimes simply have to be investigated, they have to be prosecuted, they have to be punished, even if it's logistically incredibly difficult, even if it's incredibly expensive, even if it's politically problematic. Uh, we need to keep in sight the reality on the ground, what's at stake. I'm in trial all the time. It's, it's never past my sight that what we're talking about are human beings being forcibly transferred from their homes, civilians being beaten, tortured, raped, and killed on a massive scale. The ICC cases children forced to be soldiers under terrible conditions. I started out trying to describe the development in my court, the ICTY, um, from a court with no accused in custody and having difficulty getting off the ground to some extent. Now as we're shutting down, it's a fully functioning, fast-paced criminal court with no remaining fugitives. Clearly, the ICC is not there yet, but I think with support from the international community with um, political willpower to help the court complete and work on its mission, it will eventually reach the same stage. Thank you.